Hi there, Neil from David and Move here. Welcome to the channel. Tonight we're going to have a look at Operation Theseus Gazala 1942, the latest in a series of games from Vuka Simulations that began with Crossing the Line, continued with Across the Bug River, and this here is the latest release. Uh, it's actually an unnamed series of games as far as I'm aware, but they are quite closely linked in terms of their mechanics and style of play in the system. However, each one does have a separate challenge within within its, its, its system and they do play a little bit differently from each other. Um, this video then is going to be a look at the, the game. Uh, I'll touch on the way the game plays and some of the major systems within the game. I have done a more detailed look at crossing the line and as the basic structure is very similar to crossing the line. I won't go into a full in-depth rules overview here, but I will highlight uh, to refresh people's memory or to introduce new players some of the major systems in the game as I go along. But let's have a think about the system as a whole for newer players. And each game in the series is essentially a puzzle. And it's a puzzle relating to how one player who acts as a quite an, uh, an aggressive player can overcome a, a barrier, a terrain, be that natural or man-made, and really get across the map quite quickly in order to secure the historical victory or, or the better than historical victory. The defending player's puzzle, on the other hand, is, is the reverse of that. It's how can the defending player use the terrain and and the obstacles that that are featured on the board in order to slow down that attacking player and achieve not a victory but a a win of the in the game by basically losing slightly less badly than than the historical result now in um in the original game in crossing the line um i'll just try and highlight the map um just to show some of the differences really we had, uh, it was in Arkham in 1944, and we had the sort of the West Wall, and then the, sort of the forest here, I can't remember the name off the top of my head, and it's a very small print. Um, and then there was various pillboxes and these sort of grey dots dotted around, and the American side had to sort of punch through and then get through the industrialised areas into this more open terrain in order to score some of the major victory points. And the Germans had to try and use their, their defences that they built in order to slow that, that advance down. Book River, um, which is the next one in the series, was a similar principle, but it was all natural terrain. There was very little in the way of um, man-made obstacles. Uh, and this is this is sort of a the historical battle plan, actually, on this particular, particular map. But basically, you had the river. You had to cross the river and then get into this marshy, wooded terrain and then eventually uh, try and secure this side of the map, really. And even though the principle was similar, it was quite quite different in the way it played out because you, you sort of had the, the real kind of heavily armoured American tanks smashing into the West Wall and, and, and ploughing their way through in the first game. And here you had the, the German blitzkrieging across the river. It felt like a much more mobile game to me when I've played this one. Now, Operation Theseus is the similar principle. We have the Axis player um, with the Italian and German forces uh, in North Africa, 1942, having to cross what is a minefield, which is this row of hexes all up here, plus a few others dotted about in certain places. And the aim of the game for the Germans is to cross that minefield and take certain victory hexes. Now in this game, which is different to some of the others, we do have these separate VP uh, markers and the speed with which you attain those markers will determine the victory points you get for achieving that hex or for being the, um, the player in that hex uh, at the end of the game or at the end of the turn, depending on the victory condition for the scenario. But the ultimate aim is to get to the brook, which is up here and the game is surrounded by a minefield. And so that principle of getting the Axis forces through the obstacle and through the terrain 
into into a sort of a much more open area it still applies but here the difference is getting through this this minefield is no longer a case of using brute force to um to cross the west wall with your armored divisions and it's not a case of finding a strategic location to cross with your pontoons and so on if, with the river you've actually got to try and do a bit of both because you have to you have to, first you have to enter the minefield and risk all the losses that you might risk going into a minefield then you have to try and breach that minefield and then you have to find a way of keeping the path through those minefields open because in this game supply and command lines are much more um, fragile than they were in the previous two games it's very very easy or it seems very very easy to me to, to massively outrun your supply lines on both sides because the supply has to be drawn from a HQ unit to a supply source, which is for the Germans and the Italians, is sort of this side and down here, and for the Commonwealth as it is, is along this side. But you cannot draw supply through a minefield. You have to have a breached minefield. You cannot draw it through the enemy zones of control. There's also ridges that you can only draw one ridge for a, for a supply line. And that's that's um, quite a challenge in what is a much more mobile game than than the others. The others could quite quickly get bogged down into this infantry war of attrition. But here, once you're through that minefield, the majority of these German units or, or Axis units are motorised, except for a bunch up here who who have a more of a uh, a foot or leg infantry type thing going on. Um, but once you get through that minefield into here, it's all open terrain and it's really quite easy to outrun the supply. Now, as with the previous games, there is a difference between the supply ranges and the command ranges. Only the HQ units can be um, in or out of supply. Everything else is in or out of command based on the distance to the HQ. Uh, but again, those, those command lines are very fragile because they cannot go through the minefields. The, the roads all go through the minefield and you have to be within a certain distance of the roads and the trails which is up here and here in order to be able to trace the supply back to your supply point you cannot go across the open country it's the desert so those how you manage that very rapid advance well first you hit the wall you hit the block you know but once you break through that block which is a feat in itself and then you race across the map to get to these points how do you keep those supply lines open? Because it's, it's very, very hard to do. At least it seems to me so far to be very hard to do. For the Commonwealth player, you've then got to really know when to, when to, when to hold your ground and when to run away, because you have the really beneficial um, terrain effects of being in a minefield, and some of these minefields like this one here, they have a pillboxes in them as well which makes it even more harder but once you get pushed back as you inevitably will do but push back from the the line of the um minefields you've got all this open terrain and if those panzers haven't been affected or, or taken too many losses going through those minefields the open terrain is a bit tricky for the commonwealth because you've got you know uh, a lot of open terrain, ideal sort of tank territory here. The Commonwealth do have tanks and they are, and they are powerful, but they're a lot harder to replace in terms of how you get replacement points and so on than perhaps the, the Axis side are. Um, the other thing to think about as well for the Commonwealth is there's very few reinforcements in the entire game. There's far fewer reinforcements than either of the previous two in the series. So really what you see on the board here is the vast majority of what's in the game. Um, the, the Commonwealth player are also hamstrung a little bit because some of these units cannot move until turn two, if at all. So if you decide not to attack the Free French in Bershin, they won't activate ever. You have to be within a certain distance of all these units up here in order to be able to um, use them prior to turn three. So there's some real restrictions on what the British uh, and the Commonwealth can do uh, based on the very, really quite wide line and sparse number of units. So you, really, you have to sort of think about manipulating and breaking those German supply and command lines 
how can you use these widgets uh, to, to, your, to your advantage? It's a real, uh, real puzzle for both sides. Um, okay, that's kind of the overview of the game, what you have to do. But how do you actually play? So I'll jump down to the, the trackboard that I've got and um, show you roughly uh, an overview of how, how the structure of the game works. I've zoomed in on the tracking board that's provided to help solo players keep, keep an eye on the admin in the game. When you play two player, all the tracking is done on the edges of the boards. It makes it a little bit tricky for a solo player, especially if you've got to reach across the table and so on. Uh, so this is provided just to help with the, the admin side of things. There's no solo rules as such, it, it, but it does play world solo, which is why this board is here, I assume. Um, it does look quite busy, and there's a lot on here to go through, but I, I won't go through all of it. I just do enough to give you a sense of the the overall flow of the game. So the game is played in eight turns, each of which has three phases, apart from turn one, which only has two. But in most turns, you have an, an admin phase, which is when you put on the reinforcements, which are what these counters are here. You also rebuild, replace units, uh, recover disrupted units, that kind of thing. The general admin that you would do. At the end of each turn, you do the VP marker adjust phase, which is when you assess control of the VP hexes. Uh, you determine the effect of the the turn on the VP hexes, and you you and. and uh, adjust the VP marker accordingly, depending on the scenario and depending on the VP hex itself and who controlled it. Some of the points carry through the through the game, others are removed as control of hexes changes. So it's quite a fluid thing, the VP markers. Uh, so you, that's where you have a phase for them at the end. Uh, sandwiched between those two phases, though, is the bulk of the game, and that's the operations phase. And the operations phase is a activation and reaction, activation and reaction sort of sequence. There's no I go, you go uh, as such. Um, and it's also an action point based system, uh, which I'll come on to in a moment. But basically what you'll do is you'll roll for the initiative. The initiative player uh, will activate one of their formations and then take a number of actions uh, up to the number of action points available to them. How does that all work? Well, basically you roll a die each and the winner, uh, having adjusted for any DRM adjustments, gains the initiative. The initiative player can then choose to activate. They can pass the activation to the other player or they can pass. Important to note, if you pass, the, you're out of the turn until the end of the turn and the other player can activate as many times as they have remaining until they either choose to stop or they have no more activations remaining. So passing is one of those things to think about quite carefully when you do, the play, do play the game. Should you pass the activation to the other player, they will activate their units normally, except they will not um, be the initiative player. They will not become the initiative player. They will just uh, activate on their normal initiative turn. But should you win the initiative and you choose to activate, that's when you're going to do most of your stuff. And what you'll do is you'll pick a formation and then you'll look at the formation track, which is what these tracks are here. There's one for each of the formations in the game. Let's just say the um, 15th Panzers here have decided to move. They currently are, have a, a seven on the activation track. In order to determine how many action points you have, you'll roll a die and then check the result on the current formation activation level. So let's say you roll a five, which is down this sort of column there. You roll really along the, row, along the row to get to the seven and you'll see you've got five action points for a, a seven uh, formation activation level. And so the five action points you will get to spend on actions. Um, there are certain counters in the game, for example, the um, 
counter here, which I'm afraid I can't pronounce because it's a German name. I'm going to try to try to pronounce it. I embarrass myself, um, but that that counter adjusts the the action points, um, and then then units for the formation activated, which would be in that this case would be the 15th Panzers, would be able to move or perform actions by spending these these points down the side. Um, and they'll do things like they will move, they will combat, they might try to refit disruptive units or improve defensive terrain, that, that kind of thing. And each activation that you, each each unit that you spend an action point for will reduce the action point track down. And when you get to zero, the formation activation's over, you roll for the initiative again. Of course, as you spend formation activation points, the uh, available formation activations reduces and the ability to get a good number of action points goes down accordingly. Now, why are there numbers in red? Well, this is where the uh, interactivity of the game comes in and it's particularly true in a two-player game. Um, if you move a unit adjacent to another unit, the non-active player can decide to attempt a formation reaction. Now obviously when I say a unit adjacent to another unit, I mean adjacent to an enemy unit. But let's say for example those panzer units move next to uh, a commonwealth tank, the commonwealth player could try to react and take an out of sequence um, turn with that unit or group of units. When you do that you do the same thing as before, you roll a die and based on your formation activation level and the die roll, you have a certain number of action points to spend, but you spend the red column. And it's generally speaking a much lower uh, number of action points you get when you do that, but obviously that can be very important to counter some of those moves that the, the opposing side makes. Once all the units have spent all their activations, or players choose not to activate anymore, that is when the uh, operation phase ends, you move to the intern phase and you and you move down down the turn the turn track here through to the next turn. Um, within the game um, there are as I mentioned certain laws for supply and command and they're based on the unit types uh, for HQs. So in this game, and this is a difference to previous games, you have uh, motorized HQ units, which is a little wheel, and leg unit HQs, which are uh, by a boot or a foot there. And supply is based on proximity to the tracks and the roads. For leg units, it's on or adjacent to the tracks and the roads. For um, motorized units or mobile command units, it's within the um, command distance. So it's quite uh, an interesting puzzle how to coordinate those two groups of units. Um, as before in the other games, you do have um, command ranges to the units before you're out of supply and things like that. And they and they are very important in the game because they um, they determine cohesion of the units. You can still act if you're out of command and out of supply, but there are penalties to that and so on. Um, now the big change in the game relates to minefields. Um, minefields are quite a challenge to cross, and when you enter a minefield, which are those kind of uh, uh, shaded hexes that I was showing on the board earlier, you you have to roll a die to enter the minefield. And again, that varies depending on whether your leg unit, whether your infantry, whether your mo motorized, whether you're a tank, all sorts of different things. There's also, um, uh, for the German side, there's, there's engineer units that can influence what you need to roll to enter a minefield and all sorts of things like that. Um, and basically the, the less mobile the unit, 
and the, the lower the die roll you need to, to roll. Does that make sense? So basically, if you roll a six or under for, for foot infantry, you can enter the minefield. It's a two or under for tanks. So the more mobile you are, the lower the number you need to be able to enter a, a minefield hex. Now, once you're in a minefield hex, doesn't mean to say you can cross it. Well, you can exit it again, but there's all sorts of command and supply penalties that may be waiting for you, so you have to breach it. And that's the new key action in the game, really, is breaching the minefield and learning how to breach the minefield with a minimum number of losses by stacking your engineers, stacking your uh, infantry units in proximity to a, a HQ with a good engineer rating. Um, Will, will lower your your die roll and give you a much better chance of passing the minefield breach check. If you're disrupted, you have problems. And you can also lose step losses in minefields. And so really learning and and how to both attack and defend minefield hexes is now key in the game. Really key. That's a big difference. Stacking is stacking um, but in this case there's quite a difference between the Axis and the Allies. The Axis can have far more units in the stack than the Allies. Um, interestingly when it comes to the actions and the actions are sort of listed down here movement, minefields, refit and so on. Moving your command HQs is no longer a separate action previous games you had to spend a certain number of, of action points and move your HQ, basically relocate to another urban area was the way it worked. Now they move like normal units and that makes them obviously far more mobile but also far more fragile it feels to me as well in terms of the disruption that can happen with uh, or displacement that can happen with the with the HQs. Hasty attacks regular attacks and prepared attacks all form part of combat and there are action points as before but one of the big differences in the game is the way the combat works and the changes that have happened in combat as before i won't go into too much detail about the minutiae of the combat but just to say there's a few extra steps if you played before first thing you do is you declare an attack and it has to be the hasty attack action then there's an opportunity to retreat and if, if the, uh, the opponent retreats, there's no battle. But then you can escalate. And this is when you choose to be, to use a regular or prepared attack by paying the extra costs. Regular attack is better than a hasty attack. Prepared attack is better than a regular attack. It makes sense, doesn't it? Um, and then you work out the um, combat multipliers based on multiplying the, the strength by the combat factor for its unit effectiveness rating. It sounds more complicated than it is, but there's a few steps to go through. Once you've worked out the strength by, com by um, multiplying the combat chip by the strength of the units, you then need to um, check for things like combined arms and some tanks and some infantry can now lead to a column shift. You also have aircraft in the game and these are abstracted into a, a column shift if the Axis player only uses the uh, aircraft they have available to them and the number of aircraft available to them on a combat varies depending on whether it's a prepared attack, hasty attack or a regular attack. And then finally after you've worked out all the strength and the, and the um, column shifts you then work out the DRMs based on combat support from HQs, um, support from defenders and attacking units nearby, armor superiority, any bonuses, failure to have retreated before combat, and so on. Notes D10 roll, and you reference the um, effect on the back. There's a rather large table here, and you have the um, yield tier, and you just cross reference down. If you have a red number, you have to do an effectiveness check, which is uh, 
potentially disastrous if you have a bad uh, effect in this check, particularly if you're if you're the attacker. Um, as before, there are various terrain effects, but perhaps not so many as in as in many other games. Okay. Right. High level summary of how the game works. Um, but hopefully that makes a little bit of sense, the way the game flows between players and, and some of the steps involved. OK, back to the zoomed out view. Um, just a couple of final final first thoughts before moving into the next video and then the first turn. And first thoughts really are that this is a somewhat more complicated game than the previous two in the series. Uh, the extra steps in combat, the minefield breaches, they all add up to a fair deal more challenge, I think, personally, based on what I've played so far. Um, yeah, it's going to be very interesting to play this full campaign for the first time, and we will see how it goes. Um, yeah, definitely to watch out for our the way to attack and defend minefields, supply and command ranges and the fragility of those and then how to as the commonwealth player best use the terrain once the the, the germans and the italians do inevitably break through um so plenty of plenty of stuff to think about already not even started the game yet and already think about how that might work um hopefully been a good overview for the game summarize some of the differences between this and the other games in the series and also an overview of the series as a whole and how how uh, how the game flows in a slightly abstracted way using using the board track um okay cool i will now leave the video here and jump over to the first turn which will be on a video to come very soon um, i hope this has been useful i'll see you next time